This is the Hockey News Storytellers with Ian Palver. Welcome to the Hockey News Storytellers Podcast. This week's guest is Tom Curvers. Tom is currently the Assistant General Manager of the Minnesota Wild. A former Hobie Baker Trophy winner awarded to the best player in college hockey at the University of Minnesota Duluth, Tom went on to win a Stanley Cup in Montreal. He was a cerebral, skilled blue liner that played over 700 games in the NHL, including playoffs. Upon conclusion of his career, Curvers transitioned back to his native Minnesota, where he earned his Master's of Business Administration at St. Thomas University, and then embarked on a career in NHL management, spending 10 years in the desert with the Coyotes, 10 years in Tampa with the Lightning, three years now with the Minnesota Wild, 23 plus years plus one year as a broadcaster with the Phoenix Coyotes. Tom Curvers has spent the better part of the past 40 years in hockey. He has seen the transition of the game from the rough and tumble to the clutch and grab to the free-flowing wide-open systems. The cerebral side of Tom Curvers, the player, morphed into and evolved into Tom Curvers, the cerebral, well-thought-out, respected, loyal hockey executive. In a recent conversation last week I had with Hall of Fame legend, and current Detroit Red Wing general manager, I asked Steve Eiserman, who worked with Tom in Tampa, to define Tom Curvers. Eiserman paid the usual compliments of being smart, loyal, dedicated uh, when he was speaking about Curvers, but what caught my attention was one simple line. Eiserman simply said, that Tom Curvers is a great person, and that he is. I've known Tom for the past 30 years. In some respects, we've been doing our own podcast for the past 30 years, covering any and all topics on the game, on family, on Bruce Springsteen, on stoicism, politics, and the game of life. On a very personal note, Tom, for the past two years, has been battling lung cancer. Like the way he approached his way of life both personally and professionally, Tom Curvers has battled cancer with dignity, pride, respect, and optimism. As the great Stoic Marcus Aurelius says, the impediment to the action advances the action. What stands in the way becomes the way. Tom Curvers has become motivated to stare cancer down, making the best of every day. Today, we are grateful to have Tom Curvers join our podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Tom Curvers. Thanks, Ian. That's uh, a flattering introduction. And uh, yeah, 40 years. Well, not, not quite 40 years in the game and lots of conversations between you and I along the way. Lots of rental car conversations from point A to point B in the hockey world. No doubt. And your famous, famous line of keeping it in the, on the road. I remember kind of calling you when I first got into the agent business at, at 40 years old. And I phoned you. It was like 1130 at night, driving home from Windsor. And we wrapped up the conversation. And you said, hey, Ian, because you've had miles in your car before me. said, hey, keep it on the road. You know, it's, that's always a- stuck with me. Most important thing. Uh, There's a lot of guys out there uh, in black jackets, black pants that are in the corners of rinks at games and are putting in uh, two, three, four hours of drive time after games. All different kinds of guys too, agents, uh, scouts, executives, uh, and fans. I mean, it's a life. It's a different life. And uh, we all kind of embraced it. Yeah, for sure. And before we get into the, the, your, your career and your philosophies, How's your health? How are you feeling? Um, I know there's lots of people in the hockey world um, rooting for you and um, um, we'll love to see you on the podcast. So how are you feeling? 
Oh, I'm doing well. Uh, it's been a long uh, grind. A couple of years now that I've been a cancer survivor and the last six months have been a little rugged, but really the last six weeks have been much better. So you, you take your blows and you, you keep in touch with people, family, friends, and especially our hockey network have provided strength and love and care and attention. And it all matters. It all, it all keeps you moving day to day. And, um, uh, a great life challenge and it has a lot of lessons built into it and uh, we're doing really well. Great. Good to hear. Good to hear. So why don't we start with that? And, you know, I read and we, I know, and I also read a little bit about your uh, Minnesota coffee club and um, you know, it caught my attention that when you told me that, you know, a couple of years back, you decided to hatch that and, and tell us a little bit about the Tom Curver's Minnesota Hockey uh, Coffee Club. Well, the initiation was uh, with Tampa. Uh, we had an amateur scout in the neighborhood. You know, we lived about four blocks apart by chance. So we were, we were meeting for coffee uh, here and there when our schedules allowed. Um, and then there's a number of other guys that worked for teams out of you know, not, that live in Minnesota and work for hockey teams and don't work for the hometown team. And so we're all kind of living this same strange existence where there's not really anybody around during the day, but we all gather at a certain rink at night. And we just started putting it on the calendar. Uh, there's about four regulars, and then there's about another maybe 10 more guys that would show up. We'd send out an email and just say, we're going at nine o'clock on, on – uh, Usually it's Monday or Tuesdays of the week. Those are the down days for games in most leagues. And uh, we'd sit and sip our coffee and have our conversations. And we'd drive away sober instead of sitting at the bar after a game and nice. driving away in danger. And so we created some good friendships along the way and got to know some guys better that uh, you nod at. Maybe you nod at them in a hallway at a game or you, you, uh, you just cross paths with these guys. But good group of people. And – uh, Oh, the guys that uh, are regulars, we really look forward to it. And so, you know, we've talked a lot over the years about the game, what it means, how it helps people. Um, you know, I know that your boys are golfers. You have two great young golfers. And first, tell us a little bit about what the game of hockey has meant for you. And then, you know, I know you have some great views on sport and golf and what it means for any but as sport in general, but what, what first let's start with hockey. What, 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 what do you love about the game? What has it taught you over, you know, when you were younger and now as you know, the age we're at. Yeah. The game's exciting and throwing on a pair of skates and moving your body faster than you could ever hope to run is a, it's, it's, I would, I would liken that to a skier going down the hill. I don't ski much, but you have that feeling that you're a little bit, there's a little freedom in that. And then the game itself is a demanding game. It requires all kinds of athletic aptitude and it requires all kinds of mental strength to play really at any level past age 12. Uh, up until then, it's kind of fun and you bump into each other and fall down. It's cute. Right. And the hockey moms, you know, they wear their hockey mom buttons and everyone's safe and, and uh, it's, a, it's a good team sport. And then they start to grow up and they start hitting and the game gets really hard. And I think these guys that are playing in the NHL now, say a 35-year-old, that draft of 2003, uh, those guys are all 36 now. And there's a number of great players that are still playing. They've had not, not 15 years of hockey. They've had more like 20 or a little more than that of combat, hard, physical, aggressive hockey. And those, those guys wear the scars with pride. So the game, the game, delivers you into a real rough environment and it challenges you to you know, meet up to to what goes on whether it's taking a hit giving a hit getting hit by a puck blocking a shot I tended to get hit by the puck more than block shots when I played because <laughs> right. that hurt but you have you have mental challenges as well you get berated in front of your 20 peers in the locker room by your coach who's trying to make you better. It's hard to understand that when it's coming your way. All this stuff provides you with a mental strength for the rest of your life. You don't know you're absorbing it. And in my case with health, I point to all the above as helping me uh, take on cancer, you know, head on and just 
dealing with the bad stuff and looking forward to the good days. And, and, and I would say that that's attributable to or applicable or transforms whether you play pro or not. If you played, you know, from 12 through senior in high school and then go to university, being in a locker room, you know, interacting in the same way as you just mentioned with a group of other of your peers that will help you later in life, the team sport or even the individual sport. So hockey, hockey brings a lot more than to people than just those that play the pro game. Absolutely. I, there's full respect for every guy that plays, you know, a physical brand of hockey, whether it's through junior, through college, some guys only make it through high school and then their, their hockey careers fade away. Um, everybody that plays the game understands all the above because, and, and there's a, there's a quality to it that you're kind of proud of accomplishing that and, and putting yourself through that. And I don't want to take it to the level of military because those, you know, we, we talk about battle, we talk about fight, but military separate, but we use the same words and, right. and, and the game challenges you just constantly challenges you. And that's what life does. So it does prepare you. I think the individual sports, my boys are way into golf. I think those have their place. You got to, you can't blame it on anyone else. And you, and you got to be mentally strong in, in slightly different ways. But what, what I'm looking at with my boys, just learn how to compete because in the world, we don't know what you're going to do with your life. You don't know how you're going to make a living, but you better know how to compete because that challenges in every walk of life and uh, hockey certainly gives you an advanced degree in competing. But even your, I remember you telling me about your boys and like going to the golf course, taking your bag out of the, out of your, your car, you know, the etiquette, the respect, you know, to be able to, and whether you play tennis or golf or whatever the sport is, individual or team to get along with other people to teach the life skills. I know that you have a little bit of a view on that too, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you're, you're, you're thrust into a, an adult environment. If you're going to go you know, age, uh, my boys are 14 and 12. You're expected to behave with and amongst adults in all kinds of settings, whether they're, they're uh, the, the head pro or the, the waiter in the restaurant or the, the guy who's uh, running the tea sheet, you know, right. the guy, who, the part-time uh, senior citizen who's, uh, you know, running, running the golf cart around, uh, the, keeping track of things. You got to respect right. all the people that you bump into. And once you understand that, then, then they, they help you out along the way as well. And I think golf just provides so many great features for uh, one. It's a lifetime sport. You know, we play hockey and you're done in your mid thirties. And that's, that's the best you can hope for. And uh, my dad's 84 and he plays golf a hundred times a year. So, a lifetime sport that ingrains really solid life's fundamentals as well. You know, being honest, you know, we saw last weekend in the PGA tour, you know, a reputation is hard to, hard to have and certain right. guys have it and other guys don't. And Patrick Reed is, is a guy with, with not the right reputation and whether you believe him or not, the reputation is what that whole story was about when, when he perhaps, bent the rules his way for sure and well you know I, I i took up golf later in late later stages in life and the one thing i and, and I, we don't have enough time to debate this because this would be a full podcast and that's the concept of the gimme on the green where you go and you're golfing with guys and they say hey, that's good 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 what doesn't it have to go in the hole you know but that's for another day yeah, that's that's local rules or or uh, the game that you get in. You got to adjust to them too. That's right. So let's go back to the hockey. So you win the Hobie Baker, and lo and behold, you end up in the most well one from one story program in Minnesota, the Duluth Bulldogs, to going to the Shrine, the Temple, you know, the Montreal Forum. You know, walking in that locker room with Ganey and Robinson and. Patrick Waugh and Bobby Smith. And what was that like? Like you go right from there and all of a sudden you're in like the Mecca 
of hockey. Uh, what was that experience like being on a cup team? And uh, tell us about that. Well, it was a great entry into the NHL and you named all those guys and, and, and Guy Carbon was a hall of famer and he was on that team and, and great veteran hockey pros and good people. And, uh, and I lived with Chris Chelios, maybe the best American player ever, arguably. And so we got our start in a perfect environment to forge a long career. And, you know, we got, we won the cup in 86 with a, with a team that is stuck together. And then we added Patrick Waugh, uh, you know, at some point during that year too, he took over the net, uh, his rookie year, my second year. And you got to have a goalie to win a cup, but I, you know, he was the biggest part of us winning a cup, but what a place to win a cup uh, in that sure. city. They hadn't won in seven years. And that was at the time, that was a lifetime uh, wait. You know, they didn't like that. That was far too long. They hadn't had one since 79. And there we were uh, in a Stanley cup parade at age 23, uh, sitting next to Chris Chelios in a, on, on uh, St. Catherine street. Right. And, and the city is alive. And, and, and I don't know if I can even describe that memory other than, uh, was fortunate to be part of it because it was just one of those great days in, in your life. And, you know, start to, you know, the, the whole organization, um, the way they carry themselves, the way people dress for a Saturday night game or really any game in Montreal, the way that the game is held on high and, you know, it's been compared to religion, all that stuff's true. And the attention factor is off the charts and more so today than when we played. And, um, I was fortunate to be drafted by them and I made it and we won a cup. And, you know, if, if you clip my career right there, that's a successful run. <laughs> yes, it, was it, that, it was that good. Those first three years. Right. And uh, we got to have a little shout out to Lou Debelwa, my partner, Dom Debelwa's father, a uh, class act and um, raised a great family. And uh, now I'm doing business with his son, Dominic, who's a great young agent. So, uh, well, he was a good stuff. veteran too. He was an excellent uh, veteran. Just everyone, when it goes right, the guys throw in all the stuff that's needed. And, you know, Doug Sotart, Lou Deblois were really good, solid veterans who weren't prime, prime time players on that team, but they mattered as much as Patrick Waugh. Now, so let's, you mentioned um, um, Chris Chelios, um, you, who you were a roommate with 1917 games in the NHL. But over the years, one thing that you told me that I'll never forget um, about Chris Chelios, and that was Chris Chelios, when he was playing the game, had a short memory. And, you know, tell, tell the listeners what you meant by that. Like, and, and how did he survive all these years and what made him great? But the short memory, a lot of people, a lot of young players, current players could really learn from what you mean by short memory. Well, really simply, if I made a mistake and then I heard about it on the bench, I would dwell on it. And, and to my, it, and it harmed my game. When Chris Chelios would make a mistake, and everyone's making mistakes all the time, but if it was a prominent mistake or if it was something that he got blamed for, maybe it wasn't his fault. He just sort of turned the page right then. It's like, yep, got it. And he kept playing as if there was no error made. And to his credit, it, he almost used it to elevate his game. And he, he was also, he, he was almost pain-free. He, he absorbed a lot of injuries over his career. He wasn't the biggest guy, but he had a pain tolerance like no one else I ever saw, whether it was to come back from injury or whether it was training or you name it, he, he just, he could handle all of the mental challenges of the game and he could handle physical pain. And the biggest thing that I noticed with him right away and that I try to preach to our young players in our system is you got to love the game. And I mean, he, he loved, he was the first guy on the ice. He's out there shooting pucks, the last guy to leave. And he, you know, for a guy who was a fellow rookie, it was almost like I looked up to him in all those ways because we were, we were there early. We, we, we did extra. We were in the gym. We were shooting pucks after practice. We even stole a stationary bike from the team. I don't know if anyone's ever found that out, 
but the bikes were getting uh, calibrated and they were sitting by the door and he had an SUV before SUVs <laughs> were everywhere. And we stuffed one in the back of the SUV and we had it in our basement. And he said, we got to have a bike because I talked to Paul Coffey and he rides the bike all the time. So we're riding the bike more. Wow. So Chelios was committed to hockey and it paid him back in a big way, but he gave a lot. He gave a lot and he was a great teammate. He's one of the first names that comes to mind when I think about the best teammates I ever had. And, you know, he's, he's earned his status in the game yeah. and with, with all the above. Quite a guy, quite a guy. And well, uh, you know, recently I heard on Spit and Chicklets, he told the story that you didn't just steal a stationary bike, but he claims, and I don't know if it's true, and maybe it was him, but he made reference that you guys were able to snap a couple jerseys out of the laundry room in the forum along the way. And they're probably in his basement, not yours, but, you know, you know, the secret squirrel, Tom Cur Curvers, you never know. Well, we were college age and uh, the, the jerseys were hanging there and we had a, we lived across the street from the rink. How about that? So we were in, we were in the rink. It didn't matter when we came or went. We were, we were there all the time and we ended up with keys to the locker room. And I think a couple extra jerseys made their way to the apartment. And, and uh, I remember very clearly the day that Guy Lafleur first retired from Montreal uh, everybody's in a room in the arena. I don't remember where the room was, but for the press conference and we were coming off the ice and there was a, there was no one around. Everyone was hustling to get up to the press conference and we hustled into the back room and got all his sticks and ran them over to our apartment. Oh, really? <laughs> so I still have a Guy Lafleur stick and I wow. have it up in my, it's up in my office in St. Paul. Okay. And, uh, and so Guy Lafleur was the biggest star that I played with in the league. You think Chelly's selling them out of Chelly's Chili's back door at his restaurant in I, Detroit? Or? <laughs> no, I think he would hold on. He'd probably play in the driveway with it, but I don't yeah, think maybe. he's selling them. So, um, um, yeah, that's that that's that's good humor. That's good humor. So let let's shift out of Montreal, and you know, we just recently been talking about obstacles in the way, and so you leave Montreal, and then the realities of being a pro Jersey, Toronto, Vancouver, you know, you start moving around. Um, you were always an outstanding offensive player, but what was the reality of playing back then in the NHL? Um, and, and how did you learn from it during your career about having to be resilient and whatnot and forging ahead? Well, the game was so much different back then. We had, you know, we, there's there was so much more intimidation and and really each team had four five six maybe even seven guys who could really fight and if anything happened on the ice there were fights going on way more often than today and i think i had offensive skill but i didn't have the the willingness to cross check every guy that came in front of the net because i didn't want to fight him or the next next guy who came out and decided they should, I shouldn't be doing that. And you had to have some serious courage to stand in front of the net as a defenseman and lay the lumber on guys and then just take whatever came your way, whatever guy came off the bench the next time. And I never really got to that point. Chelios did. A lot of guys did. And a lot of guys faked it and did a good job of faking it. But the game was really hard back then. And then when you, so you changed teams and I changed, I was traded six times. And you change teams and you you get in the locker room and you see a, a new teammate and you realize that he's skinny and that you could have handled him, but he came out ferocious like a like a lion after something happened out there. And there's a lot of ways to be a little bit leery of guys, if not straight out scared of, you know, scared of the Wendell Clarks and the Bob Proberts that were out there lurking. Right. Um, but you had to be leery of so many guys. It, the game was different, but then I, I would I, I go back to when you get traded, you end up being buds with these guys that you were that you were dealing with all the time, and uh, that part of it was you know the best part of the ride is having so many acquaintances and having stayed in hockey, having so many of these acquaintances where you played with the guy for a few years or a few weeks, you you you, you go you look back on it like you grew up together. And think about that. I mean, just on your Islander team alone. You know, you are an assistant general manager. You've been around for 20 
five years in management and you look around and uh, Tom Fitzgerald's a GM in, in, on, in New Jersey, coach Travis Green, you know, and Ray Ferraro is a extraordinary, you know, a color commentator, extraordinaire with TSN. And like it, 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 it's you, what's a message for a current player who's playing and gets moved around or with the current team in terms of networking and being a good teammate? It all comes back to you, especially if you stay in the game. Well, I think you could ask every guy. We try to do this at the start of the season with my uh, my prominent job with Minnesota as GM of the Iowa Wild American League team. And I like to ask this question, who's your best teammate and why? And run that question around the room at our first meeting. And the guys come up with great answers and they're heartfelt and they're maybe their best friend was their best teammate or maybe a guy that uh, just made a huge impact on them. And then I simply ask them, well, Take what that guy does and bring it to our group. Bring that, bring that element into our room, and we're going to have a successful year. I couldn't tell you what right. our record's going to be, but we're going to have the elements that, that are needed for a team to succeed. And you, you, you just – so, yeah, you want to talk to a player today, be a good teammate, show up on time, don't do anything that, you know, be detrimental to the group's success, and – you know, 30 years later, you'll have earned a reputation. You'll, you'll have earned that handshake or a hug from a guy that you bump into in a rink or bump into randomly uh, as, you, as you walk through the rest of your life. These, these years that you play, they're just so precious. They go by so fast. Um, enjoy it. Play like you love it. That's the Chris Chelios model. Play like you love the game because there's so, so many ways to get frustrated and so many ways to get down. Um, you got to keep fighting that off and show up with a smile on your face. So true. And, and the resiliency and understanding time and patience and just, you know, putting your time in and getting better every day and waiting for your opportunity, of course. And then when that opportunity comes, you got to be ready. Yeah. Um, yeah. That door opens. You got to go flying through it. You can't tiptoe in. Um, so you, you play your career and, you know, do you ever harbor any, um, thoughts about what would a Tom Kerber's New Jersey Devils, I think you were 50 or 60 points, ran to the conference finals. What would Tom Kerber's the player be like today in today's NHL where, you know, the hacking and slashing in front of the net is almost non-existent, you know, um, and you see these guys flying around and generating points on the power play and, how do you think you would play in today's NHL? Yeah. I, I, or do you not that, think that? I I think I could have played, but I would have had to do a lot more work on my legs. They're, these guys are more powerful than I ever, ever got to. And the skating is such a priority factor now. It, it, was, it was always a factor, but it's, it's more important now because there's, so, there's no way to stop anyone except your legs. There's no way to cheat and hook and grab and hold. It's just legs. It's just, it's just your mobility. So that I would have had to, to, to play in today's game, I would have had to be uh, stronger than I was when I played. But the puck stuff and, uh, and shooting and passing, uh, that would have translated just fine. I, what, what's interesting is with the advent of all the analytics and, and all the chatter about analytics, I wonder what my analytics would have looked like if someone ever does the time capsule, the back to the future analytics thing and, and can grab a game and, and apply today's analytics to games back then. I, I, I wonder if I would have been good or not in that analytics uh, uh, assessment. And knowing that I just described to you that I wasn't, I wasn't as willing to start or to cross check a big guy. I wasn't, I, I just, I was aware that I could get the, my brains beat up if I was right. doing that out there. And, you know, maybe, maybe I'd be good in, in, in today's game with the legs. Give me a, a set of legs from today and not, not the ones I had that right. I think I could have played. Fair enough. Fair enough. So um, let's uh, kind of transition like in career transitioning 
you end up your hockey career and you had done some work with the NHLPA on the business side. I remember you got involved in the licensing committee um, for the, you know, through the strike of 92. Then we had the lockout in 94. Um, you were involved, you were a leader, and then you, your career wraps up and you end up going to do your MBA. I assume that you had your undergrad degree from Minnesota Duluth. Yes. Yes. I, so how I finished. Was, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. When, when did you finish? Did you do four years at Duluth? Yeah. I played four years and, and had my undergrad finished. Oh, so you did? I, I started my uh, graduate work on the, uh, the, the, the reason I started was I played in Vancouver, finished a year in 91 in Vancouver, and Brian Burke had put together a program for the Vancouver Canucks players that simply stated if you take a course in the off season, provide proof of passing the course and a receipt and they'd reimburse for it. Right. So I, 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 Brian McClellan, Washington's GM was in a graduate school program at St. Thomas and I got a contact from him and I got started. So for 91 to 96, when I retired those off seasons, I was taking a course a summer and uh, I had a written end of my contract uh, for tuition reimbursement. So I was kind of on a scholarship uh, while I was in the NHL and I went back and took, I, I was hacking away at this graduate program at St. Thomas. Then the first year that I retired and didn't play, I went back to school full time. So I finished it in a, in, in a school year in an academic year. It would have taken two years. Would I got half of it done while I played. I was really proud of that. Right. I was playing in the NHL and, and I was taking these courses and I thought I was, you know, being aware of uh, life after hockey and and uh, I can't say anything bad about the graduate program but there's no way to be certain of what you're going to do on your post career you, you have to give so much to hockey while you're playing um, I, I wouldn't change how I did it but I'd be more aware that it's not always going to follow the game plan so I have a graduate degree now and I scouted for 23 years and, and scouting's a great life, but it, it doesn't require a graduate degree. I'll put it that way. But did the graduate de degree in the discipline of doing something while you were playing, keep your mind active and fresh so that maybe you were a better scout and like, Hey, TK, say what you want. I don't see too many guys in the business today that have done three consecutive stints of 10, 10, and three out there. So maybe that time where you were grinding back at the school, you know, did help you prepare for post-career. I, I, I'm certain of it. I'm certain of it. I abs it absolutely helped. Uh, there, it, but it helped more in life than specifically to hockey. You got You've got 30, we'll have 32 teams here. You've got 32 plum jobs as general manager on the hockey side. You've got 32, maybe double that number for assistant GMs to a team is about normal now. And then you've got a director of player personnel title or, uh, you know, a sort of a top dog scout. Uh, so maybe another 32. So you got, you got 125 of what I consider the, the best jobs. And to, to stay in that, category you know to, to rise from pro scout and from amateur scout into some sort of management or administration or oversight overseeing a department yeah it's it for sure helped me do that it, it absolutely helped me do that um but in life it just opened it opened your eyes to all the other avenues of people living good lives and made you more able to interact with people from different cultures people from different um, points of view, uh, whether that be religiously or politically or whatever, you just it just created a better tolerance for everything that's out there, better understanding. Uh, I I would not, I mean, that absolutely made a difference. Made, made and, a difference. And, and and one of my themes here, and um, you know, uh, there's going to be an up upcoming podcast with uh, our mutual friend Kenny Baumgartner, who ended up doing his Harvard MBA, who was your teammate on the island, and I think. So kind of that's what all brought us together, you know, that Islander team and me at the NHLPA and with you guys. But one of my themes when I have former players on is to really 
help send the message to current players and future players about how important it is to think about post-career while you're playing and not necessarily education. It could be anything. It could be, you know, firefighter, could be paramedic, could be, you know, um, doing, um, you know, getting in, involved in vocational work or whatever it may be, carpenter or apprentice work or whatever. So um, how important is that? I think it's important. You, you have the time and you have the off season. You have the ability to find something that you're interested in. But you got to be cautious because, you know, more so today than when I played the game, the game pays you back pretty well. If you give everything you got to the game, um, you're, you know, and you're a good player. Uh, there's no sense in uh, missing out on training sessions to make sure that you, you know, get educated on something else. If you're in the midst of your career, I'd recommend, you know, be aware, you know, dabble in it. But these off seasons, these guys work so hard. They work right. so, uh, the training is just incredible. It's, it's impressive to watch. And there's all different methods. All the methodologies that I've seen require extraordinary amount of work and pain. And that's really where your bread's buttered. So don't, not in lieu of taking care of your, your career as a player, but to be, a, to be aware is a good thing. As our, as our former uh, comrade Bob Goodnow used to say, hockey pays the bills. Mm -hmm. So you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. And maybe that, the, saying it how you just said it is, is, is what's to be emphasized going forward. You, not, in, in, not in lieu of is, is the best way to put it. Uh, well, well said. So you and your management career got to work with, among others, uh, uh, Bobby Smith, Chuck, Fle uh, uh, Cliff Fletcher, um, Chuck's father, um, Brian Lawton, um, and uh, Steve Eiserman. Uh, maybe quickly, kind of, what were the lessons learned along the way? We don't have that much time, but maybe a, a soundbite on each of those guys or what you picked up, um, you know, along the way. Well, I watched, uh, I, I worked with Wayne Gretzky in Phoenix for a number of years. Right. and and Steve Eiserman in Tampa for eight years. And, you know, their, their level of respect in the game are, you know, they're, it's different than everybody else. And I watched how they handle themselves personally. And I, I, it was time well spent to be around that caliber of former player, that caliber of Hall of Famer. The, the key thing with both those men were just, they're good people. They're good. They'd be good neighbors if they'd ever played hockey. They were, right. they were brought up in, in a good household and they were, they were, they're polite and they're, and they're, they're just, they're good to the elevator watchmen. They're, they're good to people. And you notice that. And then they have their ways of, they have to protect their whole being They're especially, uh, you know, Wayne had, has to protect himself from, the crowd almost anywhere, anytime he goes in public. And I watched that go on and I watched it again with Steve and they just do a great job of, of making a random fan feel like they got their minute of attention and then, and then cutting it off so that they can carry on with what they want to do. Um, it was fun to, I mean, I don't have to, I didn't need to learn that because I can't apply it, but, those it was more of a, right. like a social documentary watching those guys operate right. and how they what they are required to do to sort of protect themselves different and level yes much different level the, the guys that that i work for you know one one good story i'd share with you is i worked for don maloney for one year in in phoenix well don and i uh, you're very aware of this uh, with a arbitration case where right. he's a first year general manager with the Islanders and I was a player and I was yep. fighting, fighting the system and, and um, went to arbitration. I held a grudge. I held a grudge for a long time. And, you know, that's normal in hockey. You hold grudges. You're, it's a confrontational game. It's a challenging competitive game. And when, so when he showed up in Phoenix, I was not real pleased to be working for this guy. He came in and took over as general manager, but in the course of that year, uh, we found common ground 
and I let go of my my grudge, and I don't even think he was aware of it because he, he, he was <laughs> right. He was a new a new GM, and he was yep. probably like all GMs when they start, they're drinking from the fire hose. I don't think he even knew that that would ever been on my mind. But I consider Don a friend now, and for right. for a lot of years there, I didn't want to bump into him. I didn't want to say hello to this guy. Um, and that's a lesson in life, not necessarily a pointed to education or how you play the game. It's forgiveness matters. And, and it's, it's not a native thing to a hockey player to forgive. You, you, you remember, you don't, for, right. you don't forgive right. and forget. And so as, as I learned that, um, that helps your life. It just, it's a tool for your life to be better. If you can figure out how to forgive for whatever reason, whatever, whatever gets your goat, forgive and move on and you'll be free. Just hockey's a microcosm of life and you come across all these great, you know, you're competitive, competitive, and then, you know, you move on and you realize two good guys just doing the best they can and, you know, you can't hold that grudge. And I've, I, I, I lived it when I was in my union days and now as an agent, you come across guys you battled with and everybody's just trying to do the best they can so long as they're telling the truth and not trying to backstab you. So, yeah. um, you know, good stuff. And and what about quickly, like your experience with the passionate Brian Lawton and his zest for life, like unparalleled or unmatched? Well, Brian gave me a, you know, he, he, gave, he brought me to Tampa and, uh, you know, gave me a, a better uh, job title. I, I made more money. I, I stepped into a more uh, decision-making role with Brian in Tampa. Um, unfortunately, everything went a little sideways down there with, you know, starting with ownership, but Brian's been a friend for a long time. We've been through some life situations and helped each other out. And uh, to today he checks in regularly and uh, he's been a good friend uh, in the last couple of years when I've been dealing with my life's challenges. And so right. Brian's, Brian's a little different. He's, uh, he's not everyone's cup of tea, but he's, uh, sincere when he's your friend. He, he looks after people. He's, he does a lot of things people don't know about. Yeah. I, I, it's fair to say that me and you are big fans of Brian Lott and he's doing a great job on his, uh, NHL network. And, um, you know, he's done it all in hockey. He went from player to agent to management to broadcaster you know so i'm gonna have to get him on the podcast for sure yeah. one day for sure yeah, for sure so good man um so tell us a little bit about and i know you love to hot stove but you know what's it like kind of like going to the game whether it was with eiserman gretz watching your team play and then what goes on after the game you guys go back to the hotel or do you go to the coach's office? Do you review and review and review about what went on? Or how do things go? And, like, what's the best part of, like, being part of management? And is it the hot stoving? Is it the strategy? What is it? It's the competition. You're, you're in your group of guys, and you got your management group, and then your key scouts, and then, you know, the rest of the staff that have uh, all have important inputs. And you're trying to put it together to try to compete, to try to win the Holy Grail, to try to win the cup. And so if I just go, I'll just use the Tampa example for two years, you know, the ownership was in flux and wasn't much franchise stability. And yet we still talk hockey. I can see Oren Kulis today and say hello. I can see Len Berry today and say hello. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't trying to make it go upside down. We just didn't, and there wasn't enough money available to run the team and crazy decisions were made along the way, but you know, you bond together and instinctively, especially if you played the game, you know, you might have played with or against a guy and you kind of know what they're about from time on the ice, but you, you pull together, everyone pulls together. And I think different from the agent side where you're, you're kind of lone wolfing it and you're, oh, yeah. you're, you're assessing your, your player's performance, whether it's a 10 to one win or 10 to one loss, you got to have an assessment there and you're trying to help that guy navigate his career. When you're, when you're with the team, it's pretty simple. Are, are you good enough to make the playoffs? Are you good enough to chase the cup? And it took us a plenty of long time in Tampa with Eiserman in charge. He doesn't do anything in a hurry and try to speed up the process. 
I believe he's doing that in Detroit right now. He's not going to rush it and mess it up. He's going to be patient and do it right. And their time is going to come ahead. But yeah, you, you're just chewing on it all the time. But he's also the same age and he has three daughters and I have one daughter in the same age bracket. And you talk about life too. You talk right. about uh, tuition. You talk about right. all the things that, you know, really make your personal life go around. And it, the best thing about it is it wasn't very difficult to get to a, a point of comfort hanging around with the boss. And I'm not sure that that's the same everywhere with Steve Eiserman. It was pretty easy to be comfortable around Steve. He made it, he made it that way. And, and I'm uh, sure, I'm sure it's similar like that with Billy Guerin, who's, um, you know, a man's man who can, you know, really light up a room or with his humor or his kind of good charm, humor, bravado, um, you just make, he makes you want to be around him. With he's good to thing. people. Yeah. He's, he, he, he is just right. good to people. He, right. He's a good person. Right. Yep. So, um, what's the key, um, whether it's in, for you in management, sustainability and longevity and fitting in and adopting to different management groups, what would you say for you? It was the key for longevity and success in what you do because you know you see management groups come in have great success um and then five years later they're fired and um then they're out of the game you don't see them anymore what what what, what, what was your secret sauce in addition to what eiserman said being a great person right because you know that's a given to some degree but you have to have other skill and characteristics and know how to read the room, I would imagine. But you tell me. I think the first thing is knowing to shut up. You're not, I mean, I haven't been in charge. So I've been in charge of pro scouting. I've been in charge of amateur scouting. Oh, you're I'm screaming. in charge of, I've been in charge of mine. Yeah, your screen up. Oh, better. Oh, yeah, I've been, in char- I've been in charge of, uh, the Iowa wild farm team, but know when to keep your mouth shut because there's a lot of things that are said and they might come out at the wrong time and, and you can cause harm to yourself. So know when to keep your mouth shut. And then real simple one is learn to say yes. If someone asks you about, uh, can you do this, you know, uh, uh, put you to a task. The answer is yes. If you don't know how to do it, go find out how to do it. <laughs> Right. You know, but say yes. Yeah, I can handle that. And and that person who's in the authority position will be appreciative of that, even if it doesn't ring a bell the first time. Before long, you'll have more on your plate and you'll be closer to the decision making capacity. But uh, I learned that one from my brother in law, who was an executive. Uh, and he just said, no, no, that saying yes is a good thing. Right. Nice. Okay, so um, one last question, and then we're going to kind of move into the last segment, which is a kind of fun little banter. But for future, for future um, aspiring people who aren't hockey players who want to get into management, right? And maybe a Julian Brisbois who never played the game but figured out his way. Any tips? Any advice that you can give um, to that young, you know, student in Minnesota, maybe played Minnesota high school hockey, knows he ain't going to be a pro going on to university or whatever. Any tips to give? Uh, You got to be persistent without, without crossing the line and being a pain in the butt. But you, if you have a contact and, and there's something that could be available, that's when you got to be mind your P's and Q's and make sure you're available and make sure that uh, you check in with whoever that is where you think there's an opportunity. And then once you get a chance, once that door is open and you get in, now you got to work as hard as you've ever worked because there's so many that want in and you got to prove your worth. So if you're worried about your salary, if you're worried about the hours, uh, then go find a nine to five job. There's, there's lots of good ways to make a life uh, nine to five, but if you really want to get into this life and you, it's a life, it's not a job, it's a life. You're going to give up nights. You're going to give up weekends. You're going to give up 
many things that your peers are enjoying. And uh, there's not necessarily going to be a big payday either, uh, unless you, you know, make it all the way to the top. Doug Armstrong's a good example. You know, he made it. Right. But right. there's not that many guys that are coming from non-playing or non relate you know family doesn't have a, a family connection right. on the inside it 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 takes it takes uh a couple breaks along the way you got to have a break and then you got to take advantage of it right and and sometimes putting yourself in a position to get that break whether you can have a little something that you've researched something that makes you a little bit different you know, gives you a leg up. So whether you're a blogger, analytics person, whether you have this new theory on how to run a team, even if you're a student and it's well thought out and researched, and if you can bring that to the table, it can't just be, I love the game, I want to work in it. Um, I think it's too competitive nowadays. The other point I would say is be specific on what your entry point, what you want your entry point to be. What you just said, I love, I just want to help any way I can. Well, I, if, I'm, if I'm hiring scouts and I hear a guy say, I just want to help every way I can, he might want to be a coach. He might want to be an analytics guy. He might want to be uh, you know, in charge of a uh, farm team. But if I hire him to scout and then halfway through the year, he gets a, a gig as a coach or whatever he really wants to pursue, I'm stuck because he's going to jump ship. So be specific with what your pursuit is, where, where do you see yourself fitting in and what department and then go after that. All right. Well, so that, that's great. Um, we've had a good, you know, thorough review of your life, your career, um, kind of a fun last wrap up segment for you. I call it the chase on this podcast, couple of fun questions. Um, one jumps out at me. Well, actually I was thinking uh, while we were talking, it's like, and you may not have the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. How many nights do you think you have spent in a hotel in your life? Oh, boy. I mean, oh boy. think about it. I mean, I mean, how many years, oh. how many years do you think you have? Slept? 20, I'd say 2,500. That's a quick sort of 20, 100, 100 a year times 21 where I was strictly scouting. Right. And, and I wasn't scouting as much the last couple of years. And, and then you got summer draft and you've got. Yeah. I mean, you trips yeah, to Europe trip, Europe. I mean, you've got, you're, but you're what, out, you're out and about a hundred nights for sure. If you have a full-time scouting job. And well, what really, about even when you were playing too? Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. yeah. 80, 82 games in 192 days. 40% on the road, you know, you got a little less time on the road than at home. Yeah. You could wow. be 12 years in a hotel. I could be a lot. That's yeah. 12 yeah. years. N no I mean, doubt. I, I, I mean, I've been going since 90. I, I think that I am at least three or four years, but I didn't have all the years of when you were playing. So I think I could be five years, but I'm not in your category, but so while we're on the topic of hotel, are you a, uh, Marriott or Hilton guy or what are Marriott you? Marriott that's the scouts that the scouts stick to Marriott okay I know some of you some of you agents went off off on the Western thing yeah of course that's Marriott way. now yeah yeah but but yeah it's been Marriott the whole ride for me so TK let's say you're not with the team and you're traveling you're on a secret mission you're in a city you get to a Marriott Vancouver you walk in with your bag you check in. Do you care where your hotel? Do you care where your room is in the hotel, or like they just give you the key card and it's like, take it wherever I get. Middle of the hall, right near the elevator, end of the hall. Does it matter? Elevator, not, not near the elevator, and uh, not next to the concierge room. So okay. You don't, you don't right. have to be on the six a.m. wake up call. Fair those, enough. Yeah, those you, two things. Do you ever get into a room and like look in there and are you ever a guy that goes down to the front desk and says, just doesn't cut it for me. I've been traveling. I need something quieter. Or are you yep. just like, there's guys out there. They don't care. They just put their bag done, go to sleep. No, nope, I go back down. It's got to, it's, it's got to, it's got to make sense. You're going right. to be there, especially if you're going to be there for three or four days. Yeah. 
Complete you can't be sense. you can't wrestle with that. That's got to be at ease. I have to be back of the hotel, not on the main road. No connecting room. No, no, that's a key for sure. No connecting room. No connecting room. Yeah. All right. So you wake up, you have a good sleep or you don't. You wake up, you go down into the lobby and there's a Mary, there's a Starbucks in the hotel. First, there's a Starbucks in the hotel. Do you consider that like there's a kiosk? Do you consider that as a Starbucks or if you really want a Starbucks, will you get into your rental car or will you go across the street if there's a Starbucks to get your coffee? I've heard about you Starbucks snobs and I'm not one of them. Okay. I'm, I, I'm, I will steer it to Tim Hortons in Canada. Okay. Um, and I'll, I, I will walk, you know, I, I'm not necessarily, you know, if you have to drive, I'll, I'll go to Tim Hortons to get the coffee. Um, for the most part, uh, I don't recognize the difference. You know, if I have to have a, if I want a coffee and it's only Starbucks kiosk, I don't care. Okay. That, so that, you don't that care. Doesn't, that doesn't just, hit me hard. No, you just pump the canister, get your coffee and go. Yep. Okay. Yep. What about like, if you're on the road, will you pull into one of those sheets, skull uh, gas stations or um, a seven 11 and pump a coffee or it doesn't matter. Or if you need one, or will you chase after like a caribou coffee in Minnesota or will you go for a chase off the road for something? Or do you just like, you want to get home so you'll be efficient? Yeah. I try not to eat at gas stations. That seems like a. No, not uh, eat. I'm talking about just, just coffee. Um, I, I would say that, yes, I prefer to get a coffee from a coffee shop. Okay. But I'm not. I'm only like Tim Hortons or if I have caribou versus Starbucks, I go caribou. I mean, I have, I never really thought about it, but I don't go out of my way. I, okay. I wouldn't say I go out of my way for coffee on the run. I usually, uh, we have holiday gas stations here. I'll drink holiday gas station coffee. Okay. Okay. Can't last couple of questions. Is there, is there any particular burger, pizza, diet if you're not following a diet out there on the circuit of nhl teams or even ahl teams where or a diner out there that you would say you gotta go to if you're in a city is there anything like is that jump out at you or you're pretty easy going in that category i'm pretty easy going in that i yeah. i i like i mean basically you live on two meals a day and the first one's in the concierge room at the hotel Right. So now, you, now you're down to one meal and you got to, you know, if you're in the NHL, if you're on the NHL circuit, you can get a decent salad and a plate of food in the, in the press room. There you go. So you are, you are just, you're running it. So you don't burn time. I don't like sitting in a restaurant by myself. So you go to the, you go to the press room and you're with some media guys or you're with some other scouts. And that's your social, that's your social connection too. You've been sitting alone all day, whether you're traveling that day or you're in the state in the same city, you're pretty much not having conversations all day long until you get to the game. So you need a little of that social awakening each day too. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, Tom, listen, uh, thanks for taking the time to do this today. Um, it's something we've been doing for, um, you know, 30 plus years, but to do it this way is special for me and uh, hope for you. And um it's great. Absolutely. So you next time you're in mini, you're invited to coffee club. We'll, we'll wrap it around. Will sports group. Bring you Can't in. Can't wait. I mean, as soon as they let that open up the borders again. That's right. Yeah, That's right. So. Let's get past right. that. Okay. All right, pal. TK. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. <laughs>